So I was playing a board game recently, and the card prompt was, what was the best life advice you've been given? And it took me a while to think about it. Um, and I don't quite remember who said it or what the context was, but I heard it during my teens, and the quote went like this. The world will ask you who you are, and if you don't know, the world will tell you. And my initial impression as a teenager was very much a warning against peer pressure and to not be the same as the rest of the world. But this understanding has morphed over time, and I crystallize this into three emotions, fear, confidence, and humility. Some of my earliest memories would, in fact, be to the moments where I didn't have a voice, or rather, one that could be understood by people. In the words of my mother, it was not that I was a silent child, but they kind of knew there was an issue when I was yakking away to myself, but no one could understand me. I soon realized that the phonetic classes that I remember when I was a kid were in fact not a rite of passage for every child, but I was speech delayed. So even to this day, my parents are very intrigued that I decided to join the debate club in middle school. Looking back later to my knowledge, I believe that this was one of the pivotal moments which would shape the rest of my life and my personality. The problem with me in debate, however, was that I was terrible at public speaking. Um, compared to my peers, I didn't have uh, the eloquence, the vocabulary, and most importantly, the confidence that they seemed to have on the floor. I remember um, in my school, there was a big amphitheater, and my friends would force me to be at the top, right at the top of the stairs, and I would articulate and speak loud enough all the way downstage during training. So the fact that today I can stand in front of you and hopefully not mess up is testament to them cheering me on and training me really hard. Style was actually one of the most important factors in competition, so this was actually really important for our team. But me not having a voice, I believe, was also testament to not having self-confidence and identity. High school, I'm sure all of us can remember it, was a cesspit of everyone trying to size each other up, put a label to everyone and everything. For some reason, if you can recall, everyone was simultaneously trying to be as different and unique as possible, but also exactly the same as everyone else so that you didn't have to stand out. As with any growing adolescent, I was on a journey of self-discovery and identity-seeking as well. But everyone's identity, at that point of time in life at least, was always tied to things you could do, accolades that you amassed, or people that you hung out with. You had the jocks, the athletes, you know, good-looking, popular, bringing in the medals for the school, the musicians, the artists, who I believe talent um, showcased so clearly for themselves. You know, I always wanted to sing and dance like, like, like these friends could. And also, the people who just seemed to do so well in school, and you know, everyone is like, okay, I can't achieve the same results, but at least I have a life, right? <laughs> During high school, at least. So I felt that I was like trying to be in a superhero ensemble, but not quite having any superpower. And it was not a very good feeling, I imagine. I remember once I even ranted to a friend. I was like, sigh, you know, I wish I had a clear talent like all these other friends we had, a way to impact the world. And I distinctly remember my friend saying, but Paul, you like to read. And I was like, ew, <laughs> what use is that? You know, is that even a power or a, or a talent? So through my teenage years, this life quote, going back to it, was my resolve to be different and unlike the world, not to give in to peer pressure. However, despite how I tried to convince myself that I was counterculture, it was very obvious that I was still trying to fit in. I was envious of talents which felt so clear and seemed to be bestowed on my friends from birth. And therefore, I, I knew that my assurance and identity was still relative to others and dependent on the opinions of others. I would trace my growth of being my own person when I first took a flight to the United Kingdom alone to begin my first year at the University of Cambridge. 
I was absolutely stoked. I got to live independently in a new country, make new friends, and for the first time, study the course of my dreams. This is the only institution I found that combined politics, psychology, and sociology together, and I was living for that, this combination. So Cambridge was absolutely breathtaking. The coach pulled in to Parker's Peace, our central green. The air was cool and fresh. It was autumn. And it was actually more modern than I imagined because I was told that cows would be grazing around. Um, so my college was next to the river cam. Uh, cobblestones, bicycles, hedges, exactly like how I read in novels. First year university was hands down intellectually the best year and happiest year of my life. I felt exactly where I was supposed to be. I was enjoying every single book and essay I was reading. I've never experienced school where I could only, I would only need to study things that I love, i.e. no math, no sciences. Great. So in first year, um, I had a chance to just go to lectures, sponge up all the theories, experiments that try to, uh, to explain mankind. And I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed being able to argue or provide my own arguments, give a distinctly Asian perspective to what I saw as a kind of knowledge that was predominantly Western still. I loved banging out essays, talking to professors, because I wanted to. And if people ever ask, I'm telling you, this is what true love feels like, at least in first year. But all jokes aside, I learned that I am a very passionate person. And passion is something that motivates me. And this is a trait that brings me on all the way even to today as a professional. It was to my utmost surprise then, when my best economic accolade also came at this moment when I least expected it. Because I did not feel like I was studying at all. I still remember the moment when my professor called me all the way from England to when I was having a family holiday in Taiwan. To be, congratulations, you topped your cohort at the end of your examinations. And I started to work on the courage to tell myself that, hey, I can be good at something. And this was especially a pivotal moment for me because before that, I was always trying to just see what I could do, could be, but at this moment, I was trying to build on my self-confidence project. I had to push away actively a lot of fear and guilt for giving myself the space to be happy or proud for myself. Even trying to imagine, much less utter the words, I am smart, without cringe, without saying a but, or need to clarify, went against all the conservative sensibilities that I've grown up with. I don't know where you are at with your culture, um, upbringing, or family conditions, but if you're anything like me, I do truly hope that you're on a journey to believe in yourself and articulate your self-worth. Looking back, this self-love for me was pivotal for me to grow further, because this confidence allowed me to then move on and grow from a new milestone. For example, you could always just keep replaying, uh, repeating the same level in a video game, but you can only move on and grow as you evolve. What is in a name? My Mandarin name given by my parents is actually Xue Tian, which translates to English, learn to be humble. And I believe that in my pursuit away from arrogance, I hung on so tightly to humility that I perhaps forgotten on confidence. And if I am to distill a trait that impresses me today from all the cool, smart, amazing people that I've met, it's not so much intellect, but self-awareness. Self-awareness is not just about what you know, but knowing what you don't know. And if you're highly self-aware, you can objectively evaluate yourself, manage your emotions, and align your values with your actions. Individuals who shout someone down in an argument or shut someone out from conflict aversion may seem to be reacting in diametrically opposed ways but to me, actually show the same arrogance of blocking out any possibility of them to be proven wrong. It's very easy to be self-congratulatory in truisms and never be falsified. For me, it was not vital to simply rest on the confidence of what I could do, but to reframe what strength is. A pivotal moment came when I encountered a self-assessment tool called Clifton Strengths something which is very similar to MBTI. I realized that it is very 
popular in Shanghai. Interestingly, the theoretical basis of this assessment is that you don't need to be good at everything, which is counterintuitive to the notion of excellence, especially in high school. Instead, focus on honing your strengths. And in that sense, you don't need to, or you rather cannot be good at everything. Quite aptly, in a full circle, back to my ill moment in high school, my top strength, I realized, was that I am a learner. How can that be a strength, you might ask? I asked myself that too. <laughs> According to the assessment, learnings, learners tend to be open to change and value the process over end results. And they're often natural teachers to then help others learn as well. And by understanding what my top strengths are, it helps me to be more aware of how I approach situations, my motivations, and how I can value add to the team members around me. Of course, when these strengths are not matured, they can also reflect as your weaknesses. For example, just because I love to learn does not mean that everyone does, and some people learn as much as they need to do. And I think these tools ground me to know that my identity and strengths need to work and live in a place where there are other identities and strengths around me. So how does flux, or the inevitable churn in life, factor into what I'm sharing today? First, I'm very aware that the notion of the three stages being linear through fear, confidence, humility, as I presented it, is actually not linear, it's an illusion. The truth of the matter is the project of self is never ending which is also the beauty of growth. And in my 30s now, I still get a lot of social anxiety and fear when meeting new strangers. And it's difficult for me to move to a new city and start from scratch each time. I still sometimes give myself too much credit in a workplace environment as well to rely on my own strengths instead of others. In a way, fear, confidence, and humility, I believe, are states that constantly interact with each other and my dare say as well that we need a healthy dose of all in our lives. Number two, another thing about flux that I learned is that it's okay to change and want different things. After my master's program, I went back to Singapore to join the public service to manage cultural neighborhoods of Singapore. This was my way of giving back, hopefully, to society, but it's also because I was acutely aware that I'm not inherently profit motivated and therefore did not join the commercial sector. My work experience exposed me to things that I had previously shunned, though, and it only made me a stronger and more versatile professional. Once I had disdain for the commercial world, but I learned that I had to be able to speak the language of business in order to further the things that I cared about, such as arts and culture. I organized a public arts festival that celebrated the history of a heritage neighborhood and local artists but whose murals had to be presented on buildings owned by businesses that did not care so much about arts and culture, but rather how it profited their business because of better programming. This was when I started to realize that worlds, as big as they seem, need not always be mutually exclusive. How can we strike up a win-win situation, and what must I know and learn more of to be able to communicate across worlds. Moving away from the public sector to the private sector now, the, there are still things that innately um, matter to my voice and identity that guide my decision making. I'm, for example, still not inherently profit motivated at my core, but I accept that it's a very necessary goal for business entities. I find it important to understand the value and mission of businesses before I join them, or to understand what motivates them uh, to sell their products. Last, is stability the opposite of flux? I don't think that flux needs to necessarily always have a bad connotation of being in chaos or being unsure. I actually actively seek out flux, for example, uh, moving to new cities like Jakarta and now in Shanghai, in order to have growth opportunities. To the surprise of many, I had switched jobs previously at my peak to come to Shanghai in a moment where it did not seem as stable because of the pandemic. It was honestly a very difficult move for me in the sense of adapting to a new culture, language, uh, and learning the ropes of the private sector. 
But despite the challenges, I am very excited each time I encounter a situation like that because it allows me to possibly learn and grow, which is a core tenet of my strength. So going back to the quote, building myself an anchor of self-awareness lets me know clearly what I can offer, but also what I need to learn. It gives me the stability of assurance and guides my path in how I treat myself but also the people I meet socially and professionally. It took me quite a journey in order to be comfortable in my own skin as a nerd and gain the confidence to be proud of what I'm good at, as well as the humility to know what I need to learn. My experiences from university and work have developed from my younger perspective of just being different for the sake of it. And far from being a prescriptive call to be counterculture, this quote strikes me today as a very extremely wise observation about how central self-identity is, but even then, how that evolves over time. So your answer will first require you to get to know yourself. It does not just stop there, though, because this conversation with the world is a dynamic one. The world is constantly in flux, especially with factors beyond our control. But who you are and what you hold on to will become the critical anchors of how you navigate the inevitable changes that come your way. So I hope that everyone will be able to find the confidence in yourselves, in your personal identities, have the self-awareness to know what you are good at, but that you are just one lovely voice amongst many, and to uncover the values and motivations that will surely fuel your way forward. Thank you, everyone.